Let's get started. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm Lucy Gray, and I'm your host for the next uh, hour on, and we're going to be talking about project-based learning and technology tonight. So the slides are available in our Google Classroom, and you can also directly access them at bit.ly slash tech talks, or tech talk 10 slides. And everything that you see will be clickable and accessible, you know, from, from now on. So you can follow along with um, what we're talking about tonight, even if you weren't here. Uh, our Google Classroom is available at classroom.google.com. It's important that you log in with your personal Gmail address because your school one may not be allowed to go into other people's Google Classrooms. So um, if you haven't created one, uh, I would highly recommend you doing that for personal use. And then there's a plus sign in the upper right hand corner of Google Classroom and you select join class and then you put this code in, which is YXFLGJ7. And by the way, I have a poll going tonight. Um, oh, there's Ruby. Ruby must be logging in from Mexico. Hi, Ruby. There's a poll up tonight that is new, and I think you should be able to move it once you've filled it in. There are just a couple questions that I thought I would use to kind of sample the audience since we've been getting a few new people here and there. And I believe once you've taken the poll, you can move that window to the side. I don't want to end it right now because people may be dropping in. So um, if you can't move the poll, um, let me know and I will end it and then it will disappear. But if you want to take the poll while I'm talking, that would be great. Okay, and we've got Natasha, it looks like joining us too. Welcome, Natasha. Uh, I was just going over, I'm gonna back up for a second here, um, just to kind of make sure that you all know where to get the resources. So we're using something called Google Classroom. I'm gonna mute um, you, Natasha, just because, uh, so we don't have background noise. Um, but if you have questions, just jump in later on. Um, so all of the resources you're gonna have in tonight's project-based learning webinar, are in our classroom. Anyone is welcome to join. So if you have friends, family, colleagues who are teachers and they want these resources, please have them um, join like this. And I'm gonna keep going. So you may wanna take a picture with your phone or something of this information so you have it for future reference. But just to uh, re review this, you go to classroom.google.com, you log in with your personal Gmail address and uh, you select um, the plus sign and join class, and then you put this code in. And the code is YXFLGJ7. Uh, it's not going to change, it's always gonna be the same code. And you should see kind of a Facebook-like interface that has all of our content um, from the past nine webinars. I do have to upload last week's video though, and I will do that probably tomorrow. So, and along with this one. Um, so everything is in there, including, uh, you know, an evaluation tool, um, links to additional resources and links to the things that I refer to today, a copy of the slides, um, and typically the recording from the webinar. So uh, make sure that you, hang on to this information because you can always access this during the school year or whenever. All of our webinars are going through August, um, but the, these resources will live on um, forever. Um, this is our title of tonight's webinar. It's Tech Talks number 10, Developing Project-Based Learning Opportunities. And this is meant to be kind of a precursor to next week webinar, which will be pre-recorded. And that is on global um, project-based learning, global connections, making global connections for your classroom. So uh, I really want to kind of lay the foundation for that. And then next week, I'm going to go into even more detail about how you can connect your classroom to the world. And it's a topic that I am passionate about and, uh, and, and have a lot of experience with. And so I hope it'll be helpful to you. 
We want to thank Rio and the Educators Rising program for making this possible tonight. And we have Kim Toby with us who is part of that program. And uh, we're very grateful to them for making us or helping us come together tonight. Um, if you would like to know more about the Tech Talk series, we have a flyer that you can share with others. And it also lists the webinars that we've done and what we're doing going forward. Um, so you're more than welcome to share that with people in your school for professional development purposes or friends or whomever. Uh, my name is Lucy Gray. I'm a former classroom teacher and a technology coach in schools. And now I'm a consultant and an adjunct professor at National Lewis University in uh, the Chicago area. And think of me as your personal tech coach between now and the end of August. I'm available uh, through Twitter or email or whatever to answer your questions and help you if you have any um, needs. Um, and that's my information there. I have an additional role to add to this tonight. I'm very excited to say I am returning to a school. I will still be consulting, but I am going to be an educational technology director at a private school here in the Chicago area where I live. Uh, the name of the school is North Shore Country Day, and I'm really excited because it's a one-to-one -one iPad school, and I'll get to apply everything I've learned and coached people in over the last nine years. So. It's gonna be really, really exciting. I'm starting soon. Um, uh, probably I'll be, I'll be working in the school by the end of this webinar series and, uh, and maybe they'll even join us once I, I get on board with them. So I'm very excited about that. Um, tonight, I thought we would take a few questions about last week's webinar on flip learning. Um, and I'll have a few comments about that. We'll talk about the ISTE standards I'll give you an overview about PBL and um, see if you have had any experience with it and that sort of thing and share that tonight. And uh, I'm going to have tons of resources for you as well. So that's what our, um, our plan is. The ISTE standards stand for um, the International Society for Technology and Education. And they have standards for students, teachers, administrators, brand new ones for administrators. Uh, computer science teachers and technology coaches and um, I'm going to be pointing out the teacher standards that are applying to our work uh, every webinar and their conference just ended today in here in Chicago I was at it until about noon today and if you are on Twitter you can search ISD 18 and find uh, resources people also hashtag um, use the hashtag not at ISD um, uh, to share stuff with people who are not able to attend the conference. It's it's expensive. Some people don't travel that sort of thing. People are busy so uh, People want to partake in it somehow and it's it's very cool how the whole community has made an effort to kind of share their resources out using that not at ISTE hashtag so um, I think it's really important to know the ISTE standards or be aware of them because they're I don't think they're as well known as individual state standards or common core. Um, and this gives you some justification for why you're teaching things in your classroom if administrators are dubious. So I think it's a good thing to have. Um, we're going to be focusing on the learner, leader, collaborator, designer strand tonight. Um, you're improving your practice by being part of this um, professional learning community and, and talking about technology. You're seeking out an opportunity to empower your students and improve teaching and learning by being here. And we're collaborating by sharing our experiences and that sort of thing. And project-based learning especially is applicable to the designer standard because it's really about designing authentic learner-driven activities. So this, is the, this is the format for really doing that. And, um, and so that's what we're, we're talking about tonight. So we talked about last week flipped learning, uh, which is a movement that's really grown over the past few years. And essentially it's giving students background information before they come to class and using class time for more teacher driven, um, or it's, I guess it's, it's, it's learner centric, but teachers are there more to help than anything. So uh, typically a teacher will assign a video for students to watch at home uh, on their personal devices or school-owned computer if they have a one-to-one -one program. 
and then the kids and that gives kids some information and kind of a lecture piece of things and then they come to school and they do more hands-on activities with the teacher supervising and coaching there are different variations of this um, but that's essentially what it is and I'm wondering if anybody has any questions from last week at all I know we only have a couple people here so if you have any questions shoot them in the in the chat um, and uh, you know we can answer them uh, there is a has flipped learning been used in special ed yeah absolutely but I think it depends on your population of special ed if you're working with learning disabled students um, I think it probably is the best fit uh, it's a matter what I think it's what I think about it what I think about it is it makes you be very structured and intentional with your work um, or in your planning process and I think kids that have learning issues benefit from things that are written you know that come in multiple and allows allows them to participate with different modalities so if you have students that may have dyslexia for instance maybe you're really you know maybe listening and watching a video will help them understand the content better than reading it um, or using a podcast and that sort of thing with autism I think so I mean it, again it depends on on the spectrum um, you know kids who have Asperger's sometimes are really high functioning uh, and it also allows for self-directed learning to a certain degree you can also sometimes provide um, different you know some choice within the flipped learning like maybe they you give them three videos and you ask them to watch one and I think when students can take control of their own learning and pursue what they're interested in um, that's important I, we could probably dig into that a little bit more. I'm wondering if we did a search, let me out of curiosity, and see if there's anything that comes up. Flip learning and special ed. And we'll see if anything comes up there. So here's, um, so here is, it looks like there's a lot of content here going over it and saying why it works well with it. And so I think people do think it's a positive thing. Let's take a look at this um, and see what it says. This looks like an online degree website, which tends to put out articles to attract people there, but maybe it'll be, oh, it's University of Texas. It could be good. So here it's benefits of technology. It's self-paced. It's personalized. Okay, we know that. But that's not really talking about special ed particularly. Um, here's an article that says it's changing the face of special ed. And let's see if we can see all that one page. So the technology reduces anxiety is one of their points. And that often you'll see with kids with, with uh, who are on the autism spectrum. So here are some examples of how they're doing it, um, and and I think the important point is that the content is more accessible to students. Um, I'll put the link in here because you're giving it to them in multiple in multiple formats. The other thing that we have not talked about, which I am not an expert in, I'm not an expert on this either, but. Um, there's a group called CAST out there, which is um, a special ed group. And they are the proponents of something that I think ties into this called UDL, which is um, Universal Design for Learning. And it's about how you design your assignments in, in classroom to benefit not just the kids who have special needs, but all students and how to make things accessible for people. And I'll put this in the, in the chat as well, um, because I think this might, be, this might tie into it. And then I think this also relates to project-based learning, because project-based learning will allow your students to thrive in, in ways that are different than uh, being lectured to. I think in general, I would say to teachers, we don't want to see you in front of the classroom so much um, lecturing students and then giving them a worksheet that's like very traditional it's easy and when you're a new teacher that can be a crutch that you might rely on 
um, or using a textbook entirely. We want to see uh, we want to see things that allow for student voice and choice, uh, for them accessing the content in, in different ways, and that, that gets them excited. And I don't think worksheets and lecturing kids really does that. So in, in your, you know, every once in a while, that's fine. And sometimes you need worksheets that are uh, graphic organizers or something that will make kids make sense of the content a little bit more. That's fine. It's when you're overly, when you're relying on that stuff too much and um, I think that's that's what we want to avoid and it takes a while to get there as a beginning teacher so I would not you know I don't want to make people feel bad if they are teaching that way but that's um, but that's uh, just try to kind of think think about how you can increase the sophistication of your teaching by moving to more student-centered and student-directed kind of work and flip learning is one way Project-based learning is another flavor as well. So I'm going to give you, um, what do you know about PBL so far? I mean, already, I'm, I'm curious. Um, is there, what's your, you can grab the mic if you want to. Um, you can type in the chat. Have you, have you done any projects at all? Ruby? Uh, just from a teacher prep perspective, Lucy, we uh, tried to take a look at how we could train our students on project-based learning. Um, it's been difficult from an online perspective because a lot of PBL is, very, is truly very hands-on, thus the project. Right. Um, so that's just a more personal note from a program perspective, but we have had when we um, had we have we were fortunate to have a noise uh, a, a national science foundation grant and the, the students that we worked with as part of that program uh, really got to be engaged in whether that was using um, makers um, just lost the name of it but we're literally there designing these projects so students are working with not just uh, the information we're trying to learn, but they're putting that into practice. Um, so again, if they're dealing with, you'll go into this, but whether it was they were dealing with fractions, whatever, they were able to build something out of it, make something out of it, and then therefore the learning became much richer for them. Okay, yeah, and I think it is, um, it, it, so, so Ruby, we're gonna go into a definition of it in a minute, so that will help you. But there's, a, there's also a difference between projects that kids do and project-based learning. Usually project-based learning is collaborative in groups. It is uh, working on an, uh, you know, an authentic problem. Sometimes it involves technology, sometimes it doesn't. Um, and there's usually an end product with it. And we'll, we'll learn about these. They're kind of like seven or eight kinds of characteristics of project-based learning, and we'll learn about them in a second. So, um, uh, it is hard and it's and it's also when teachers are not used to creating their own curriculum and finding their own resources and and designing as you're saying Kim it can be difficult if you're in a school district where they hand you the curriculum and say teach this and stick to that and do this do that only that's really difficult um, for you to kind of go and do this there are some school districts that do this quite a bit there are some schools that are completely devoted to project-based learning. They feel like this is the way that you should do it all the time. So um, the, the, the big place to go for, the, the, the leader in all this is a group called the Buck Institute for Education, which is also known as BIE. Um, and BIE.org, I think BIE.org is their website. I could be wrong. I'm going to talk about it a little bit more. I'll, I'll talk about it now because it just makes sense. So these are like the leaders in this organization, they're based in Northern California. They have a national faculty of educators who are trained in project-based learning who can be hired to go and work with schools and coach them. So every, their website is full of everything you can need from being a beginner with this to you know, you know, more advanced kinds of things. And then there's some schools that have gone this way and they're I'm thinking particularly of two networks. One is High Tech High, and it, I think High Tech High now has a middle school component, which is in San Diego. And um, if you've seen the uh, the movie, um, 
Oh, most likely to succeed. Um, most likely to succeed is, is a book and it's a movie um, by Ted Dintersmith and, and Tony Wagner. And it highlights, and it's, it, it's a great movie talking about how schools are changing and what is going to prepare kids for this new world that we're living in. And you can rent or buy the movie and do a screening in your school. And I highly recommend it for parents and for faculty members because it really spells out why it's so important to be kind of changing how we're learning. And, and project-based learning is, is, is what people do in real life. That's what we do. You probably do, Kim, at Rio with other educators online when you're planning different projects. We've been, we've been working on projects together, and that's real-life project-based learning. So this is it's an opportunity to learn content. It's an opportunity for student-based, student-centered learning. It's an opportunity, and, and student voice and choice. It's an opportunity for students to practice 21st century skills that we talk a lot about, those soft skills of creation and collaboration and communication. It's all wrapped up in one, but it takes time, it takes planning. So we've got the Buck Institute, we've got networks of schools like High Tech High, there's another one called New Tech Network, which is not just high schools, and there's schools that, um, so let me tell you about the, the flagship school. I should show you a picture of it, of New Tech. It's really interesting. Um, so New Tech High is a, a New Tech, there's, so there's High Tech High, and then there's New Tech um, Network. And the New Tech Network has a bunch of schools under it, and their flagship school is New Tech High in Napa Valley. And I've been there, and it's awesome. So what schools in this network, uh, pay this this foundation to have a coach that works with them um, on the project-based learning model and they have a they actually have a back-end uh, um, platform for teachers to put their projects on and communicate and the kids to do the projects and it's called echo and I don't think it's available publicly it's something that they've built in-house and a lot of schools who have been struggling have adopted this model because they feel like we have nothing left to lose. You know, we want to engage our kids. But it's not necessarily for, you know, for poor performing schools. It just is, um, it's just a choice in, in, um, in school design that some schools have made. So the new tech high in Napa, um, what's interesting is uh, new tech high school, um, Napa, let's see if it comes up. And we maybe we can find some pictures of it. Here's the high school. And you walk in, and it's it's unlike any other school you've seen. Um, I don't know if there are any pictures of it. it. Doesn't look like it. There's their Echo. There's an Echo platform, learning management system. Um, but you walk in, and they it's a it's a gold lead certified building, which means that it is environmentally sound. It's been designed with environment in mind, and they have a monitor at the front that tells you how many. You know, how much CEO they're not producing that goes into the environment, things like that. It's kind of cool. And there's a big meeting space when you walk in um, where the school meets on a regular basis. It's pretty small. And then the classrooms are huge. And all the furniture, bolt, furniture is flexible and on wheels so they can move and not be sitting in you know rows and, um, and they can work collaboratively. And they teach like they teach certain subjects together in an integrated way so they do biology and PE together for instance so um, so anyway this is you know this is all part you know Buck Institute New Tech High Tech they're all related a lot of their the Buck faculty come from these schools they also do a conference together called PBL World which is um, we just had it like maybe last week in Napa at a different school um, you know, a thousand people come from all over the world to, to, to learn about project-based learning in action. So that's a little bit about, uh, you know, what's out there um, in, in terms of who the, who the players are. And this is the Buck website, so you guys can go to it. It's also in the, in the, um, in the notes for, for this. And then I wanted to show you a video really quickly, which is, again, Last week we watched one that was done by Common, this company called Common Craft on the flipped learning project. And they also have one on project-based learning, which is great. Um, 
because I think it's very simple and I and Ruby I think you'll get it after watching this video so I'm going to play it I'm gonna mute I'm gonna mute myself and then play this and you should be able to hear it. if you can't let me know in the chat okay I can't hear it either, so hang on. Oops. What it was like in school. It was boring. You sat in class, memorized as much as you could, and tried to pass a test at the end. But is that good enough? These days, school can be more interesting and effective by focusing students on work that matters. This is project-based learning explained. Most adults live in a world of projects. Whether it's a job assignment, home improvement, or planning a wedding, we need to actively solve problems. But unfortunately, schoolwork looks more like this than this. Let's take a look at this project-based world. Meet Claire. She was recently presented with a challenge. Her company, Super Suds, makes soap and it was up to her to find the most earth-friendly way to produce it in the future. Her boss gave her a budget and a few requirements, and it was up to her to come up with a solution. She organized and managed a team who researched the options and created materials summarizing the issues. Claire's team asked for feedback and presented their findings to the boss. Claire came out of the project looking like a rock star, and she learned a lot about green products. If you look closely, Claire's success involved critical thinking, collaboration, and communication, things that aren't often taught in traditional classrooms. The world needs more Claire's, so how do we get them? The answer is project-based learning, or PBL. By focusing students on a project, teachers put them on a path that deepens their knowledge and builds skills they'll need in the future. Here's what I mean. Mr. Simmons has always been a good science teacher and his students do well on Friday's tests. Unfortunately, what they learned was gone by Saturday morning. That wasn't good enough for him. Soon he learned about project-based learning and decided to give it a shot. Mr. Simmons got the idea for his first project on microorganisms when nearly half of his students were suddenly absent with the flu. He asked his students why they thought so many of their classmates got sick at the same time. That lively discussion produced a lot of good questions and a list of things the kids wanted to know. Mr. Simmons then announced their project was to help elementary school kids understand how can we not get sick. After dividing the class into teams, he got them started on the project. It was up to the students to ask questions, research, collaborate, give each other feedback, and figure out the best ways to make their points clear to children. One team chose to make an educational video on the connection between hand washing and avoiding the flu. Another chose to create posters to show how viruses spread. The project team showed off their final work to an enthusiastic audience of parents and their children at a nearby elementary school. Sitting in the front row was our good friend and local rock star Claire, who saw a bit of herself in the students. It was clear that the project was a success for the students, the audience, and Mr. Simmons. His students practiced critical thinking, collaboration, and communication. The project wasn't about memorization, but learning in depth about viruses and how to prevent spreading disease, a lesson they will never forget. At the end of the presentation, Claire introduced herself to the students and told them that they were rock stars and that the world needs more people who can think like them. To learn more about project-based learning, go to BIE.org. Okay, so I'm going to um, post the link to our slides in that video. Um, if you didn't get into Google Classroom, so you, have, you, can get, you can jump in there if you want to and review that or save it for later. Um, but I think this is, that was a really good, um, a really good, whoops, let me, a really good explanation of what that is. Does that help Ruby at all, that, that video? I'm gonna guess yes. 
Okay, so um, there are these essential elements to uh, project-based learning. It usually starts with a problem or a question. Um, there is sustained inquiry, which means that the kids are researching and asking more questions and really digging into the topic. Um, it usually is based on something that's real life oriented. Students have, you know, some voice and choice in this and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, there's lots of opportunities for reflection so kids can blog or, um, you know, uh, do other kinds of, of reflective activities to support whatever they're doing along the way. It's not just a one-shot deal, it's throughout the project. There's an opportunity for critique from classmates, um, and you have to really teach kids how to critique effectively. It's not something that you can do um, you know, you, you, without some guidance from a teacher. And then students didn't have an opportunity to revise their project, and um, then there's usually a public product in the end. So Ruby, I was asking if you, if the video helped you understand project-based learning a little bit. Okay, good, all right, awesome. So these are kind of the elements to this, and it takes a while to get there, so you know, don't stress out about it, but these are kind of the, the characteristics of project-based learning that you need to know about. There uh, was one model of it that the Buck Institute promoted, and now they're promoting gold standard PBL, that's their, their branding of it. And they've also started a consortium of high, something called the High Quality Project-Based Learning group, I don't know if it's a group or what it is, but there, there's kind of a consortium of organizations that have come together, and I'll find the link, I think the link is in the resources for you, uh, to endorse this kind of model, and those organizations have, you know, probably resources that also support it as well. Um, one of the things that we've talked a lot throughout all these webinars is that it's important for you to get connected on Twitter to other educators and to learn from them when, you know, just in time, it's, it, Twitter provides just in time learning and, uh, you know, you can access information a lot quicker and, and learn kind of spontaneously and serendipitously through it. So I put the link here to the Buck Institute's uh, Twitter handle. They typically do like a, a webinar every Wednesday. I don't know if they still do this, but they do a webinar every Wednesday that's free on a topic related to PBL and they post the, the online, the, the recordings of it. So, you know, they may promote something like that. Um, they also have a list of their PBL experts, their national faculty members that you can follow on Twitter. And then I highly recommend two people specifically. Susie Boss is a, a consultant and writer who's written multiple books on project-based learning. And she's an awesome human being, as is Jennifer Klein, who has done a lot of global project-based learning and, and, and is an amazing curriculum expert. She's, had a, she's an American. Um, she's completely bilingual. And she's currently the head of a school in Columbia that's all project-based learning. So those are a couple of people to follow on Twitter. And then PBL chat, um, Twitter chats, let me show you what this looks like. Twitter chats are ongoing conversations. Sometimes they meet every week online. Sometimes it's just asynchronous and they post all the time, you know, using that hashtag on Twitter. But if you go to Twitter and you search for that hashtag, you know, up here in the corner here, um, you're gonna see a whole threaded discussion from people who are interested in project-based learning and people are, are, are sharing uh, ideas and inspiration related to it. So here's a tweet from the Buck Institute on, on why they believe that, you know, um, why it's important. And then, um, you know, so there's a lot of stuff in here that may inspire you, an article, a tip, um, all sorts of kinds of things. So, Keep that in mind that this is also a continuous source of learning if you're interested in this topic. Um, then, um, so some examples. Let's talk about some examples. And I'm going to go into one that's, that's not from these websites in a minute. That's from a friend of mine in a, in a minute. Um, but High Tech High has done a great job of putting out all of their student projects. 
So, and I think most of these are high school, but I could be wrong. So you can look through and you could replicate some of these. Um, and if you also watch that Wayne, um, the most likely to succeed uh, movie, there's a, there's a lot of discussion and, and um, they, they show you students working collaboratively on different projects and they're doing it really sophisticatedly. I think the other thing you need to get over with this is that I think people are afraid that you, if you let kids loose on something like this, that you're going to have behavior management problems. And in my experience, when kids are given something that's authentic and interesting, the behavior piece goes away. You do have to be structured with what you're doing with the students and, and be explicit with them. But I really feel like kids will, if they're trained to do this kind of model, they will they'll fall in line and they'll surprise you in ways that you would um, that you would be surprised by. So let's take a look at um, my favorite one. I don't know if it's on here. is a is a is a water like an ocean study that some kids at High Tech High did. I don't know if it's on this page, but let's say um, hmm, pick one, Ruby. Which one should I click on? I'll give you the link to it, the page. Pick a topic. Um, Maybe the rock on one. The rock on one? Okay. Uh, let me find it. I'm going to do a search really quick. There. Where's rock on? There it is. Okay. So I think every page kind of follows this format. Um, they tell you the authors and the subject area and what grade level it was. And so this, here's their driving question. Who is entitled to natural beauty? And um, I like this because it's, it's open-ended. It invites exploration. It's, it's, it's higher level thinking going on here. And so that's a description of the project. It doesn't show very much. Oh, so you click on here, product, product and deliverables. Okay, I get it. So they, do, they did um, a nonfiction narrative and a pencil illustration. So this is combining art and writing, too. And it looks like they did some field trips along with this. And then they have science involved here. Students in, in excavated marine fossil, fossils from a 45 million year old local rock material with their history museum. So you're, it's teaching in an interdisciplinary way. Um, these were their learning goals. They had social emotional goals, it looks like. And then they, you know, this doesn't mean that you forget standards, by the way. You can, I think you design the project first and then you figure out what standards meet it next. Um, so this addressed both national, uh, next generation science standards and common core language arts. And then uh, they have a nice outline of like what this looked like. So project-based learning, you know, typically I think takes a, a little bit longer than you would have, um, you know, with just, you know, a, a, a unit maybe. Um, so that's another thing to kind of think about is, is, is how do you, you know, we're, we're trying to go deeper with project-based learning allows for deeper learning as opposed to, you know, more superficial learning. And so, you know, think about this in the long run. The other thing, um, people are like, well, how do I fit this into my curriculum? How do I fit this into what I'm doing when I have to cover all this other stuff? So it takes planning to think, well, how can I kind of fit it in to what I'm already doing? How can I um, hit some of the goals I have for my classroom within a project, multiple goals? Uh, the other piece of it, too, is you may want to start small and do it at a time where you have less stress on you in a, as a classroom. So for example, May and June in a lot of schools, things are a little bit more laid back because testing has been accomplished already and that sort of thing, and you might have more freedom to experiment in your classroom. That might be a good time to do it. Um, I know another school that uh, they, uh, they have kind of an interdisciplinary week um, every year, and they um, the whole school studies a theme and does projects related to that theme, and they do it in a multi-generate, multi-age way. 
So there are lots of different ways that you can do this, but it really depends on, on what your situation is. So let's go back to our slides here. Um, this is also another set of examples that you might want to take a look at too. This is from a, one of my favorite consultants who does lots of great ed tech stuff, and he's also going back into a school. He's going to be a fifth grade teacher again. His name is Tony Vincent, and he does all these graphics, by the way, himself. He's like super talented, super talented guy. And so he's collected stuff according to grade levels um, and talked about what his criteria is, which I think is very much related to the Buck Institute's eight kind of buckets um, related to project baseline. So there's more examples in here as well. Um, I'm going to pick... Let's see what a, one with little people looks like. What can we learn about dogs? So these will give you some, I think these examples are really important to see because teachers are always like, well, you know, you can tell me all this, but what does it look like in practice? I need to know how it will fit in my classroom. And so I think these two websites in particular will give you some inspiration and show you what it looks like. So it looks like he's done, he's put, he's documented these in Google Slides and put pictures in here. So this is nice because it's really simple. I don't know if I can blow that up for you guys. It doesn't look like it's blowing up on the screen here, but um, you know, even little guys, little students can do this. And, uh, and, and you keep it to topics that they're interested in and that sort of thing. So here they have a bunch of questions. And I like this. Careful listening proved that the children indeed had a genuine interest in dogs and were curious to learn more. Thus a project on dogs was born. Um, hey guys, I'm on, uh, I'm on the computer. So my family just came home. So this is... Um, so I think this is also another characteristic. You guys may have heard of Emilio Reggio, which is, I think, a town in Italy, but it's, it's a, a educational philosophy, particularly for early childhood, that's based on kids studying their environment and that sort of thing. And this is this is a kind of a, a typical Reggio thing. You're you're talking to the kids about what they're interested in, and then you're building the project from there. And I think that's kind of a cool thing. So they did it. They went to a trip to the playground and they studied dogs that way. They had some wonderings about dogs, so that generated more inquiry. Hey guys, I'm on. Can, can you guys? I'm on the computer and and, and everybody can hear in the background. Um, and then here's their phase two. So this is something that you could easily replicate. I think with also with different grade levels, maybe this would be applicable to special ed. Um, and it looks like the kids made, made, uh, dogs. <laughs> I love this. This is awesome. So, um, take a look at the, these websites, uh, for more examples of project-based learning. And I want to tell you about one, um, that one of my friends did that I thought was awesome. And this one involves technology. And we're going to talk about more of these kind of technology global projects next week. But this is one of my favorites that was done uh, for two or three years. I think the last time they did it was last year. I don't know if they did a, a, a different version this year or not. But it was based on a book called If You Lived Here. And they changed it, the title to If You Learned Here. And they got 75 classes from around the world at different grade levels to participate. And... Um, this is their, what it looks like if the website is linked in our Google Classroom. Um, they use the hashtag if you learned here to share ideas and thoughts on Twitter. The teachers did. These were the two lead teachers, Carolyn Skibba and Mary Morgan Ryan, who are from Illinois. And you can follow them on Twitter. And um, what they did was they took all those 75 schools and they divided them into groups. And, you know, the red group, the orange group, et cetera. And they use a tool called Flipgrid. By the way, Flipgrid is now free. Microsoft acquired it last week. It's completely free for teachers, which is awesome for us. So, um, so the red group, you know, and every group answered a question every week 
And what's cool about Flipgrid is you record, there's a prompt, a video or a text prompt, and you record a, you know, a short response to it. So you're not recording for hours. Um, right in the app or on the website for Flipgrid. And so they would ask a question like, what does your playground look like? And kids in these classes would respond and, and review each other's responses and that sort of thing. So they were really kind of studying learning environments. This is what it used to look like. This is from 2015. But click on here, the prompt is at the bottom and the prompt was our schools and communities. Um, it's hard to see this because I did a screenshot from um, some other slides. And you were supposed to include the school name, languages spoken, number and ages of students, mascot, special features and programs, school location, community information, other interesting facts. That's the kind of stuff that they were supposed to share. So all these kids would click on, you know, one representative from each class would click on that green plus, and then they would record their, um, their answer to that prompt, and then the other kids would review it. What was great about this is that these schools were spread out all over the world in different time zones, and they didn't have to be talking live to each other. It was, it was asynchronous as opposed to synchronous. So Flipgrid looks a lot different now, by the way, so don't be surprised when you, you get there. They also use Padlet, which we've used in previous webinars. Um, Padlet has, allows you to put uh, sticky notes on a, um, on, a, on a digital board, essentially. And there was a prompt here where they were talking, they asked people to share a photo of their classroom or building and, um, and, and kind of explain where they were. So you can see some of the schools here. Uh, Estonia, there's one from New Zealand. There's a couple from Estonia, it looks like. I mean, it's the same school. Um, Irvington, New York. So every, uh, it looks like um, Macau is here. There's another one from China. So Iceland. So they all shared a picture of their school and kind of a little bit of you know, what, what they were about. And they did that every week and um, for six, six weeks maybe. And it didn't take up a lot of classroom time. Um, they could do it in their own time zone. And they did do one or two live events to kind of celebrate in, in the, the project and that sort of thing. But you know, obviously not everybody could participate. At the end, they used an app called Book Creator, and that is now web-based as well. And I think you can make a couple books for free, and then they charge, but I could be wrong on that. And each school created two pages of what learning looked like in their school. And they sent those pages to Carolyn and Mary Morgan, Ryan, and they compiled them together into one book. And you can go to the website and download it. So, you know, what subjects are being taught here? Uh, geography, um, communication skills, uh, literacy. You know, you, could, you can cover a lot here um, in, under one project. Now, does this fit the, the criteria that the Buck Institute would have for high quality project-based learning or, or gold, gold standard project-based learning? I don't know. I mean, I, I love this project because it was so well organized. I, this is why I'll, this is why I love the project. Um, they, you know, and the, whoops, and the advice that, um, that I, that or I would give people based on a project like this, you need to plan, you need to be structured, you need to allow people to, to do things, you know, in real time and not in real time. There needs to be kind of a digital home base, like a website or an Emoto group where everybody collaborates. You need to communicate to your participants what's going on. Um, use social media to get people involved, make it interdisciplinary. Um, again, student voice and choice, and try to look for opportunities to deepen the learning and create some sort of project, or, you know, product at the end. So this is, you know, they didn't use a straight-based inquiry kind of, I guess it's inquiry, I guess, you know, what does learning look like around the world? I guess that would probably be the driving question. I don't think it's, it's, it's obvious in the materials that they produced, but I think that probably would be it. Um, I think there could be a little bit more deepening around that with this project. But in general, I love this project and how they use technology and how uh, they, they scaffold it for other people to, to participate in it. So that's my, I, I've been talking about this project for years because I like it so much. So um, 
we're getting to the end here and we can do some Q and A if you want. I'm actually going to end on time. That's amazing. Right. And your homework tonight is, or is to look through, you can go to Google and search on your own, or you can look at the links provided, but I would love for you to find one example that you think is really good and post it in our Google classroom. There's an assignment in there for you. And uh, we can take a look at it next week. And, and um, well, actually, we won't take a look at it next week because I'm recording it. But we can, uh, we, I will share with you in, in our next live one um, what the results are. Um, so do we, let me stop here for a second and ask if we have any questions. Does anybody have any questions so far? Or, or observations or want to share what they're doing with project-based learning? You can so grab it. Hi. To go to the Google Classroom, how do we do that to post that? Yeah, let me show you. Good question. Um, why don't I just show you? So here's, uh, I'm going to go back to at the beginning. So um, I showed this at the beginning. I should have posted at the end as well. So Google Classroom is a little funky in that you, um, you have to use your own personal Gmail address unless your school has allowed you to collaborate in other schools uh, Google classrooms and most schools have, have this it's automatically not set to do this so if you use a school Gmail address or like your Rio uh, Gmail address it may not work so use a personal one you may have to create a new account and then you log in to classroom.google.com and there's a plus sign in the upper right hand corner and you put this code in and um, and that is and that is the code and I can show you exactly what it looks like too um, so just to show you demo what I just told you um, you go to classroom.google.com and you'll, you'll see when I pull up my Google classroom that I have several that I'm enrolled in some are mine some are, are, are ones from other people um, this is the one for us but if you were going to add it there's a plus sign in the upper right hand corner it's teeny I don't know why everything is so shrunken in this but I wish the interface was better you click on the plus sign in the upper right hand corner you click on join class and this field will pop up where you put the class code in okay and the class code again is and you can get it on the slides or you know take a picture with your camera or something and that will that will give you the code does that help thank you okay so that's where everything is and there's more stuff there um, Ruby is asking if I think this could be used to teach social skills absolutely I mean um, so maybe you're looking to drive some sort of you know I would brainstorm either yourself or with your kids and ask them you know hey I would you know maybe there's some aspect of, of social skills like maybe it's like lunchroom behavior or something saying what do you notice about students in the lunchroom and how they how they uh, how they take care of the lunchroom or behave or whatever and then brainstorm some things and say well, maybe we could talk about our manners or something like that. Uh, sharing crayons at drawing time. Now that would be, that seems like a little too specific, Ruby. I would pick it, I would pick something kind of broad that is going to lead them to the conclusion that you want them to draw. So like for instance, I'm thinking like, and when I was working in a middle school, I'm, I don't know why I'm obsessed with lunchrooms today, but there was always a problem with the kids. So you could, you could look at this from a problem perspective too. So uh, there was always a problem with the kids cleaning up after themselves like they were supposed to at lunchtime. And if they didn't do it uh, well enough, the principal would call it the next day an orange day. I have no idea why, orange. And orange day meant that they, they had to stay in from recess the whole I mean, they didn't, they didn't have to sit in a classroom, but they couldn't go outside or something. Um, and I don't know if they would do that nowadays. But 
um, there was some sort of consequence for orange days, right? And and so what if you could say, okay, we have a problem with our orange days here. Let's how could we maybe the 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 um, the driving question would be like, how could we improve how we take care of the cafeteria, or how we could we eliminate uh, orange days in school, you know, during lunchtime. And what you're doing is you're not obviously teaching an explicit skill, but you're getting the kids to think about what the behavior is and to focus on the behavior. And you're you're teaching, yeah, who are, yeah, high alert days, yeah, Angela, yeah, it does. And it also makes me think of somebody that we would know that we refer to as orange. Um, this is like 10 years ago too. So uh, yeah, I, I think kids aren't kept in from recess very often anymore. I think people kind of poo poo that. Um, so I might, I can't remember. I think that was the punishment, but I'm, I may be wrong. Anyway, so, so I, you know, think about it. Sometimes I think what we've fallen into a trap in in education is that we feel like there's a lesson to cover everything. Like I'm going to teach, you know, students how to, uh, use a knife and fork. That, and I'm, I'm being very literal here. Um, and it's, how do we lead them to, to develop the right conclusion or the right goal without like having to be so obvious about it? Like it doesn't, it takes kind of the, the art of teaching away from it when we're looking at everything as that concretely. Does that make sense? So how can you arrive at what you want them to do through something that's a little bit more engaging? Um, so, so just, I guess that's my point, Ruby, is like, how can you, I would pick, um, I would pick a, a kind of a global theme, not a global in the sense of the world, but kind of a, a, a overarching theme of, of something that you want to address with the kids that maybe could be a problem or just something that you want to explore further and go deeper with them. I think that's how I would look at it. Anybody else have any experience with project-based learning or have any questions? Okay, well, you guys are awfully quiet tonight, and usually you guys are chit chatty. Um, and I think we have a few new people here today, so we're glad to have you here. Um, I want to show you one more thing. Hang on. Let me go back to um, where I was in the slides. So, what's next? Um, we have these are our upcoming topics. So next week we're going, to, we're going to talk about why going global is important and the idea of global competence, but also dig into some projects and websites that have uh, opportunities for students um, to, to work on, on, on global collaboration. Uh, for example, there is a group called IEARN, I-E-A-R-N, and they, they, they organize global projects that you can join in with your students and you don't have to be the the convener of them. You can just participate. Um, so I'm going to show you some places like that. I'm also going to talk about challenge-based learning, which is a model, a, a flavor of project-based learning um, that has a little bit more of a digital emphasis on it as well. Um, so it's this is this is my favorite thing to talk about and in my wheelhouse, and I think you guys will enjoy the recording. And then we'll so we're kind of having a little bit of a break here and there. And then July 25th, we're going to talk about how we can kick up our lessons um, in a more of a digital way. And if you have a lesson that you want to, us to tackle as a group, you can bring that and we'll, we'll discuss that. Um, in August, we'll talk about man classroom management strategies, um, how, to, how to find other PD events and on online that are free like this um, because we'll be getting close to wrapping up. Uh, I also want to do a session that doesn't sound that exciting, but I think you'll find it interesting. And it's basically how to Google better. How do you how do you uh, leverage search um, to find what you're looking for? And then finally, our last topic will be uh, digital citizenship: how you can foster it in your classroom. So we're getting into more higher level kinds of topics and I hope that you'll stick with me. And thanks Ruby, I'm tired too. I had, I was exhausted from this conference. So I think it's time to call it a night. Uh, but that's what's coming up and um, you can find me anytime on Twitter or through email and I'll be happy to answer your question. Tomorrow I'll have the recording up um, if you'd like to review it or share it with anybody. So um, without further ado, unless you have more questions, I'm happy to stick around. 
Um, but thank you so much um, for coming, everyone, and um, and I'll see you in a couple weeks. I'll 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 post this one next week, but I'll see you in person in a couple weeks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I appreciate you coming. It was awesome. Oh, good. I'm glad you find it useful. There's an evaluation form in the, in the Google Classroom, and if you want to um, share your thoughts, it's valuable to Kim. And, um, and you know, get your friends to come to this, please, because we want more people involved. So if you know others, uh, please tell them about it and, and tell them to join you um, the next time we meet live. Okay? Okay, absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Bye-bye.